Yo, 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 what's up? It's your boy Agostino. Welcome to episode number 59 of the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino. How the fucking hell are you guys doing? How are you? Are you well? You fine? How's your week been going so far? Right now it's what, Wednesday, uh, 4.45 p.m. Uh, I've just wrapped up some work and I'm chilling at speaking my truth into the audio airwaves that are known as the podcast land. And I'm happy you could join me. I feel amazing, man. Shit. I guess in general, you know when you... um. I guess the older you get, the more you start to like accept uh, your indeficiencies and just your little quirks, you know? You start to like, uh, start to wear them like a badge of honor. And I've realized quite, rec- as of recently, as actually, because I've, I've been reminded of this a few times through people's uh, subtle cues, that I'm a bit of an annoying morning person, you know, just in general. Like, I, I generally feel good about everything. I'm quite an optimistic guy, you know? I'm, I'm the archetypal glass half full kind of dude and I've noticed I don't really have days where I kind of feel shitty like I don't have a conventional day for instance no don't get me yet. Let, let me retract it there might be times where I don't feel as alert or as sprightly as I usually am but by and large I don't really have like conventional days like Mondays Tuesdays Wednesdays Thursdays yay Friday Saturday yay Sunday uh not really Do you know what I mean I'm, I'm kind of even um throughout the week if anything, I might get more excited uh, because the weekend's coming around just because I know I have 24 hours to do exactly what the fuck I want, you know? Because um, by and large, the goal for me personally is to kind of reclaim my um, my time, you know? Because obviously time is the one luxury that's non-renewable. You can't get that back. So I kind of want to create a life that allows me to just do the things that I like to do. So it doesn't end up being work, you know? So when you're having to clock in somewhere uh, in order to keep the lights on, it sort of, doesn't sort of, but it is, you're kind of trading your time in order to make sure that you're fed, um, you're, you've got a roof over your head and you can do the things that you like to do on the weekends or on holidays. I kind of would like to, you know, take that equation out of it and just do things that I enjoy while also making sure I have a roof over my head and I'm fed and my family and friends are well looked after. Don't think that's much to ask, really, is it, huh? So, um, maybe during the weekends I might get a little bit more, you know, hypey, hypey, because I know I have all the time in the world to do exactly what I want, which ends up not being that much, you know, if I'm not DJing, if I'm not running or jogging or working out. Remember, I wonder if running and jogging are the same thing. Mm, I guess so, right? Jogging is what you do if you run. A, no, it depends. Your, I guess running and jogging, would the, the differential would depend on your athletic capability, right? So if you can run really fast, then you're running a marathon. But if you can't, then you're jogging it. And if you can't, can't, then you're walking it. Or if you're like everyone else that fucking does it and I don't ever get a spot. By the way, this is a a segue, right? Four years running, no London Marathon's ballot win. None. Four years running. Four years. And for sure, I'm going to tune into fucking BBC live stream. I'm going to see all these donuts dressed up in all these stupid charity gear. Right, you seen what Oxfam have been doing, right? Yeah, hiring prostitutes in fucking Haiti or whatever it may be. I'm gonna be giving money to these bloody whatever you call them, and they're gonna be running around posing, you know, with their bloody brightly coloured headphones in, and they're, you know, it's like a full kit wanker parade, isn't it? London marathons, or generally any major city marathon, it's just full of full kit wankers. Like they've got all the bloody gear, but they can't run. You know, after mile four, they're all dead. Everyone's walking. Do you know what I mean? It's as if the first time they've ever run in their whole life. Like, what have you been doing the rest of the year? Do you, do you train? Do you even run, bro? Shit. Anyway, so I guess if you, can, if you can run really fast, you're running a marathon. If you can't, you're jogging and everything else is just whatever it is in between. Um, but yeah, going back to how I am during the week, I generally feel quite good about stuff. Um, I've tried to rein it in, though, my joy uh, and optimism for the world that we live in and the world amongst around us, whatever it may be. And I try to rein it in by just, you know, making sure I don't rub people up the wrong way with my happiness, you know? Because sometimes, you know, that that person in your friendship group is always like, don't worry, be okay. You know, it can get a bit annoying after a while because you kind of want to moan and you kind of want to see the bleakness in the situation. You kind of want the person to mirror that. You don't want them to offer you a solution or to resolve it. 
And sometimes, I guess, by and large, being a guy, because guys want to generally just fix shit, innit? Like, just get shit sorted and kind of move on. Whenever someone's speaking or you always kind of feel as if you kind of have to go in with a solution or you kind of always feel as if you kind of got the answer. So sometimes I get the feeling like if I'm coming in bouncing or if I'm generally just, you know, in a happy mood, it can sometimes rub people up the wrong way. Like, oh, okay, I wonder what demons this guy's hiding, you know? It's like the, I guess I would relate it to, you know, um, there's that theory that goes around that the guy that's always talking, who's always kind of um, extremely unabashed and boastful about their sexual exploits is usually the guy that's kind of maybe a closeted homosexual you know the kind of person that's like giving you excessive amount of details about a date or a hookup that he kind of went on like oh my god you should have seen her tits tits were jamming all over here bum was all the way over there i got her against the wall i pulled down this like he's overly describing i guess maybe maybe not describing a bum and tits because you know guys always do that but he's describing the actual sexual act from the moment he closed the door or even before he closed the door, right? Every single detail of it. And it's super, super vulgar. And sometimes those kind of guys tend to... Because I remember I had... The, uh, there was this one guy who did the same sort of thing to me, um, who said the same thing to me, actually. And he was speaking about his girlfriend at the time or a girl that he was dating. Let's not say the girlfriend because, you know, maybe he might be like, oh, no, she was actually my girl, man. Um, a girl he was dating seriously, right? He was telling me what they get up to in the bedroom. Like, explicit details. And it's like, dude, man, I can't unhear this. And I'm going to see her in about 10 minutes when she comes and meets you at this fucking train station. I don't want to have this vision in my head of this girl, you know, on all fours, um, I don't know, crying out, whatever name you've given her. Like, that's not what I want to see. So sometimes those kind of guys can be, you know, they're sometimes um, hiding some weird inner demon or inner conflict that's going on in there. Sometimes if you're the archetypal happy-go-lucky half-class half glass half full kind of guy people can sometimes think that you know it's all a show it's a show you know it's just it's not real it's kind of a bit a bit fake so i understand that and i'm trying my best to kind of rein it all in and not be that you know not be so annoying but also i gotta live my truth man do you know what i mean fuck it man like dude life's amazing man there's some there's so many amazing things going on out there there's so many amazing opportunities it's never been better, man. This internet age that we live in right now, access to information, access to opportunities, being able to connect to such a wider network of people all over all over the world, um, various uh, streams of news, uh, interesting products and shit. It's just fucking cool, man. I'm sorry, you know? I'm sorry that I love life, man. Fuck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Anyways, apart from all that, um, yeah, man. Welcome to the Axios Ziggas Show. You know, episode number 59. As ever, brought to you by Audible. To claim one free book credit, please visit audible.com forward slash Aggie. That's audible.com forward slash A-double-G-G-Y to claim one free book credit and a 30-day free trial. Um, I love Audible. I use it all the bloody time. They have over 400,000 titles from some of your favorite books read by some of your favorite, favorite authors. Sometimes if you're lucky, the book's actually narrated by the author, author themselves, uh, which is always a plus. So I definitely recommend you check them out. I've been using Audible for a long, long time. Whenever I can't be bothered to lug around books, if you've ever seen my Instagram, I'm always posting books I'm reading. But sometimes if you go on a holiday or whatever, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to be lugging around ma massive amounts of books. So um, in order to make sure that I'm aware and alert, because sometimes if I'm reading an audio book and I'm at the airport or whatever, I sometimes just had like one earphone in just in case, I don't know. I get caught to my gate or there's an emergency or whatever it may be. So um, I definitely recommend you use a service like Audible and you can download um, all the audio books on your Android device through their app or on your iOS device as well through the app store. And you could also uh, listen, kind of stream them over the air. But usually I, I never usually have data. I'm not sure about you guys, but I always go over my quota for data, my monthly allowance. So I usually just um, download them ahead of time, either at work or when I'm at home. And then I can have them available to listen to afterwards. So visit my sponsor at audible.com for slash A double G G Y. That's audible.com for slash A double G G Y to claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial. Ah, so I've got a lot to talk about. A lot, a lot to talk about. A lot of stuff's happened in the news that I kind of wanted to catch up on with you guys. Number one. Have you guys seen that um, drama that's been happening uh, with a young lady called Miroslav Duma and uh, her kind of controversial comment during Fashion Week? No? Great. Let me tell you some more. So, 
Maris Abduma, um, according to Wikipedia's official uh, description of her, is a, a Russian digital entrepreneur investor in the world of international fashion. She's the founder of a digital company called Bureau 24-7, a, a fashion and lifestyle platform. Now, you might know her specifically, more importantly, from street star pictures, right? So during, I think, what, early or late 2015, she was like blowing up everywhere when kind of like the sartorialist, Tommy Ton, uh, she, What's the other guy called? Uh, Philip O. That does what's that? What's his one called? Anyway, during that whole time during Fast Week, there was this um, thing where ev all the street style photographers were taking pictures of like the fashion insiders, so the girls that worked for the magazines. Sometimes they were editorial assistants, sometimes they were photography assistants, sometimes they were stylists, and like this whole big wave of new kind of like style advocates kind of burst onto the scene, right? So everyone had these, well, not everyone, people in the fashion industry had these new idols to kind of look up uh, look up at, right? And obviously, there's been a bit of a dip recently. There's been a bit of a, re a backlash against them in general. I'm not really sure why. It might have to do with just, you know, they were just, um, it was a bit too heavy-handed at times. You'd see brands kind of outfitting people up outfitting certain individuals head to toe with whatever they're making for that season or some other pieces uh case in point someone like Anna de la Russo who was kind of known for wearing like head to toe looks from one fashion house but you know I kind of give her a bit of a uh a pass because she's an actual avid fashion fan I mean she's a fashionista in the purest sense of the word and she's got an archive that kind of rivals anyone but Marissa Abdumo was kind of one of the stand-up people during that time and uh, regrettably, her and a friend called, I don't know how you pronounce her friend's name. Uh, sorry, I, the first name I could probably get, Yuliana Serginenko, 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 or something like that. Anyway, so Marissa Duma on Instagram during Fashion Week posted a, a story on her Instagram stories where Yuliana Serginenko, I think, was sending Marissa Duma an invite to her fashion collection, a fashion, um, her show, right? And the invitation was just a standard fashion invite with the card, some flowers, whatever. But in a note, it read something like, uh, for my niggas or something like that, right? I think it was something like, for my niggas, for my niggas in Paris or something along those kind of lines. And obviously people on, on social media went fucking wild, you know, especially nowadays in, in this climate that we're in where everyone's sort of like, I want to say they're looking to be offended, but you know, that that trigger button is like, you know, they, they got their finger hovering over that fucking trigger button. And as soon as someone says something that kind of annoys them, it's like, bah, 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 bah. you know what I mean? You're kind of pressing that button excessively. Like, oh, emergency, emergency, someone says something I don't like. Whatever, da, 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 da. So that happened. And obviously she got absolutely flamed online. Flame, flame, flamed. But it was funny to see, um, what's his face? Mr. Brian Boy. I don't know if you know who Brian Boy is, but Brian Boy was kind of like one of the, first sort of like standout fashion bloggers this was before the street style pictures people kind of like took over and he's been kind of a mainstay in fashion weeks like uh he's always dressing in like kind of very outlandish uh outfits and stuff but i always kind of like his playful approach to things right Do you know what i mean like i'm not sure if he's filipino but he gives me a lot of filipino vibes he looks like a filipino that would be interested in fashion if you know what i mean like and just <laughs> type that into google uh brian boy and if and you kind of get what i mean right but i love him anyway i'm a big fan of brian boy i think he's always he always kind of like you know pushing the kind of you know boundaries or blurring the lines between i don't know whatever he is now wherever he was before so he kind of went super hard at Mar marissa abduma online and he was kind of blasting her screenshotted it and then to add insult to injury, he unearthed this video of Mirza Duma giving a talk somewhere in, I don't know if it was a fucking town hall somewhere in the middle of fucking Moscow. But it was like a really like, you know, it was kind of like, you know, those um, business B2B business luncheon things where you don't have a you don't have a, like a, a PowerPoint behind you. You have like a board where you just kind of have to change the boards. Uh, your slides are your boards, basically, or your boards are your slides. So she, he basically unearthed this footage of Mirza Abduma uh, talking at this luncheon with translations, right? I don't know who translated this video for him, uh, where, she, where she kind of goes on some like full bell, like a full tilt kind of attack on gays, um, transgender. And I think that might be it because I think the person in the crowd asks her something along the lines of like, you know, would your influence or your or your 
kind of like you know your platform in the fashion industry how will you use it to kind of like further the message that you know being gay isn't okay and you and and how will you stop how would you kind of combat against this kind of rise in the androgynous fashion you have to remember that time was when that guy called andre i forgot what his surname is but something andre something i think panjigo whatever his name is right he was kind of like one of the standout kind of models during that time and it was a big deal i think in 2012 2013 i would say right to be a transgender model in fashion now that sounds weird right but i remember it was a big fucking deal i always kind of wonder like why why do people make such a big deal make such a big fuss out of it because i was kind of brought up uh reading days of confused and id magazine you know what i mean for my formative years so i was kind of always used to seeing like shocking imagery you know you know they kind of like do it on purpose they kind of want to always or they kind of want to always showcase the kind of like disenfranchise or the kind of like the freaks and the geeks people that kind of like live on the edges of society and that's what made idm id and, and arena home and days of confused all those kind of magazines really interesting right so i never got the real big deal about andre in general because i just thought he was you know i got it i get he's androgynous but for the most part he looks great in clothes or having however um andre would refer to himself what whatever pronoun was he or she looks good in clothes and generally you know it's whatever isn't it but maybe I guess he's got a good, interesting story. What happened? Upbringing, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this person obviously brings up Andre and she goes on a fucking tirade. Mentions Andre by name, says that she would never do that. It's against her morals, ethics, da, 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 da. Just, just something very unbeknownst to... It's a, it's a point of view that you don't really hear often in the fashion industry, right? Because for the most part, you'd think fashion people would be very... Uh, liberal in their views right uh, especially political wise right you you wouldn't think a fashionista or, pers or a person involved in fashion at all would be opposed to having a model on the front on the cover of their magazine wearing a hijab right or a same-sex couple or interracial or whatever whatever taboo disability you can throw out there whatever it may be right you wouldn't expect that to be an issue because for the most part fashion is about being it's that kind of personal expression right it's that story that you want to tell people. It's that kind of like uh, creative expression um, doesn't care about your colour or creed. But it's interesting to see that there's someone who, of course, it was 2012, 2013. And since then, Marissa Duma has kind of like put out a statement on Instagram saying that these well, these were thoughts and opinions from a long time ago. And she's kind of changed. But it's interesting to see and or to hear someone involved in fashion have very right leaning of opinions. Right. Because if you kind of unpack what she says, it sounds very similar to what somebody that's a Republican or a conservative would say, right? They would say the same sort of kind of thing because, you know, if you live your life uh, by the doctrine of the of the Bible, let's say, or whatever other ideology it may be, there are things that are happening now in the 21st century, regardless of how accepted, widely accepted they are, that you'd be fundamentally against. I, I don't understand it, right? I don't get it for once, but I, I don't understand it. It's not something that I, not an opinion that I share, but I can see where that ideology or that way of thinking would come from. I fucking get it, right? But I guess for fashion, it was, it was kind of a bit of a wake up call, especially if someone that's coming from the Soviet bloc, right? Because Mr. Duma is from Russia. It was kind of a bit of a wake up call to see that, you know, even though you guys think you're liberal, for the most part, your actions kind of prove that you might be conservative. And the reason why I say that is because you look at, you look at how the fashion industry treats uh, interns, right? Free labor or whatever, right? That kind of um, accepted notion that you should go around working for free for various random people who have unscrupulous their, their practices may be, right? In the hope that someone's going to give you a lottery ticket in order to get involved in the fashion industry. Now, that message is still being perpetuated now. I think back then it's fine because I'm not opposed to working for free. I think working for free is an amazing opportunity to kind of learn from mentors or people that you respect. And if if I'm completely honest, I think I kind of got my start or my success came from working for free because I was, I interned for this uh, streetwear brand called 12 Bar ages ago. I think this is even before I went to university. It must have been like 2005 or something. I don't know when it was, right? And during that time, I was kind of on the outside. I was on, I was on the outside looking in, right? I was involved in streetwear, but not really. I was kind of a moderator on the fucking hypebeast forums. I was blogging for hypebeast here and there, but I was not. I wasn't really involved. I, I didn't even know what went into making a brand. What went into making, uh, what, what went into cultivating the community. What went into interpersonal. I don't know. Just contacts in general right how do you go about you know building connection with people across the pond who live in the states or southeast asia da, 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 whatever maybe how, how to further your career i didn't really know how to do that so i have an opportunity to kind of work for free for 12 bar and i think that, no the only thing they did is cover my 
my travel. They covered my lunch for the first two weeks. Then it got a bit awkward asking. So I just started to bring my own lunch, right? Because the travel you could kind of always get ahead of time. But the lunch kind of, you know, it got, got a bit weird. Like, you know, when people start asking you, oh, how much are you spending on lunch? You can't justify what you're spending and what you're eating. It feels a bit demeaning. For someone like me anyway, and I'm quite proud. Um, I was, well, I wasn't proud enough not to take their fucking travel money, was I? So I wouldn't hold myself up as that much of a bastion of, of fucking proudness. But overall, I learned a lot during that time, right? I learned a lot during that time. And if anything, it wasn't a, an internship where I was given the, I was, un, I was under a false impression that if I do this, I'm going to, become the creative director of the brand it was just i wanted that experience of what goes into making a brand and through that time i'd met loads of cool people like bobby hundreds and aaron bondaroff and some guys at nike like I, it kind of helped me kind of propelled me to kind of take my career by my own hands and kind of craft it myself right super super important but i do kind of like scoff at the idea that nowadays if you're a fashion head right or if you're someone that's in, really involved, loves fashion, loves streetwear, or loves the creative industries, I don't really believe that you need to intern for free anymore, unless you want to. Unless it's, a, unless it's like a, unless it's like an, an internship done with kind of medical or surgeon-like precision, right? You kind of like pick out exactly who you want to work for. You get, you have a short list of five, and you have a window of when you want to work there until. So if you say, hey, I've got, I've just quit my job. I've got two months to live to live on for free, kind of whatever I've earned through savings ever. And I want to just learn as much as I can from these five brands. I think that's quite a good proposition to make, especially especially if you're especially if you're overqualified for the role that you're applying for. I think you I think that's gonna be I think that's something that you can't money can't buy the experience that you're gonna get. And also the company can't buy that either. Because if you go into it as like a I don't know, a growth manager, right? And you lend your services for free to a brand that you admire for two months. Like, you never know what doors that may open in the, in the long run. But overall, that, that kind of like karmic value that comes from offering your services to a company who are probably way further down the line in doing what you want to do in the future and also what you're going to gain is like, un, it's like unparalleled. But if you've got an, an, a smartphone nowadays, right? And you know how to use it and you dress well, and you have a, a good eye for detail and you have a good sense of style and you have a, a generally a good taste level ever. I, I don't really see why you'd need to go and work for a, an internship for free. But the these fashion uh, industry types will tell you to do it. Right. It's a, it's a message that they keep pushing out there. Now, for the most part, you don't hear it from the kind of a uh, new guard. Right. Of of like kind of fashion influencers or fashion kind of um kind of like quote unquote gatekeepers or creative industry gatekeepers right you hear a lot from stuff like whenever i watch stuff like show studio whatever they may be they're quite entrenched in the traditional fashion kind of approach right even though show studio is quite um forward thinking in the way they kind of film things and who they get to speak on panels and the topics they speak about and the designers they showcase for the most part they still operate within that old world right that kind of clunky old world of like in interning here assisting there blah 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 and overall somewhere you got someone will not turn up on a shoot you'll get your chance and then boom there you go you're the fucking editorial assistant of whatever right i get it but I think that's quite a conservative way of going about things of like, you know, just work hard, put your head down and you're going to, opportunity is going to come along your way. It's like, mm, yeah, but nah, do you know what I mean? And the idea that you can justify having people, especially nowadays where, I don't know, living in a big, I don't know whether it's New York, LA, London, living in one of any of those free places, or even Paris, for instance, right? It's so expensive to kind of like, willingly allow people to work for free even if they can afford it right i'm not saying if they even if they can afford it is not a good look because i'm always of the i'm always of the feeling that even when it comes to my friends i always want to pay them i think i might mention this before like i'm 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 super into paying my friends if my friend's an amazing carpenter and i want him to i don't know uh, assemble a unit for me or to build something for me i'm gonna pay him now it might not be his going rate right if he if he's if he professionally charges one rate, I might not pay the full amount, but I'm gonna pay him some money, like and it won't be a nominal amount. It'll be money, right? It'll be I don't know. Let's say forty percent of what you usually charge. I don't know whatever it may be, right? 40, 60 percent. I think might be kind of a good way to kind of work around things. But I don't believe in the idea of like beer uh, as an exchange. I don't believe in the idea of like opportunity exposure. Like especially nowadays, I think the exposure opportunity comes from 
the creative, especially keep people involved in fashion, being proactive and actually putting out good work on social media consistently or on a blog platform or by starting an online magazine, especially nowadays with Squarespace. I remember back in the day, right? This is a fucking segue. I wanted to start a zine uh, showcasing underground kind of like electronic dance music. And so when I used, when I was on a bit of a 10, I was going to all these like underground parties everywhere, right? I wanted to make a zine for it or a magazine. That didn't happen. Then I went to an online magazine. That didn't happen. And for the most part, the online magazine, the, the zine thing was more so laziness and procrastination. But the online magazine was more so my lack of technical prowess. Like, how would I get someone to code it for me? Or how would I code it myself? I'd have to learn how to code. That's another skill that I have to learn. Okay, that's long. Um, who do I? How do I get someone to code it for me for? Um, I don't know for for non for a non high fee. I don't know how to do that. So all these kind of roadblocks. Te uh, technology wasn't really aligned. It didn't align itself to kind of my aspirations and my dreams. But nowadays, with stuff like Squarespace or websites like Fiverr, you could get someone to design an online magazine for you for what I don't know, a couple of a couple hundred quid. And if you're working full time or part time in a shop somewhere, a bar, save some of your money, put it to the side, and invest in yourself. Right? That's how you kind of that's how you're gonna get ahead. And if anything, coming coming in a door um, at Condé Nast. Four years after you you doing your own thing, you had an online magazine, you ran a club night, you launched a little label, you did a few collaborations with people across in Europe, just like on your own, you ever you have active social media feed, just you're just about it, right? And then going to Condé Nast and being like, hey, I want to make the jump into my career, I want to apply for this role, whatever it may be. Let's say you want to apply for a role that's salaried, cool, or even you just want to go there and just intern for free and offer your service for free, like I mentioned before. You're a much better candidate with that kind of fuck. Uh, three to six year experience of just doing the work yourself being in the field i mean having some skin in the game jeremy you know I you've got more experience that way like even launching a brand where you print a thousand t-shirts and no one bought any like you've got experience more so than other people have so it's really funny when i see people reacting really harshly against what mary sam Dumo said which obviously they should right because that what she's saying is reprehensible right no one, no one agrees with her kind of point of view right no one agrees with that especially if you're in the creative industries but it's interesting the kind of hypocrisy that goes on in fashion where people are quick to call out uh, Marissa Duma for being, I don't know, a bigoted individual or saying bigoted things. But then when it comes to perpetuating this idea that people should go into debt and work for free, they, they don't mind it because it kind of props them up, right? In a weird way. Because if, you, if you're working for free for a fashion house or a fashion label or an agency or a magazine, whoever you're working for, you're kind of adding another year uh, onto their kind of like career trajectory or career, or just in general or their kind of like um, resume. You're adding another year, another two years. And let's say each system adds a year to this person, right? You're increasing their relevancy. And if anything, these people who are kind of really opposed to the kind of digital age, they're hanging on for dear life. They don't know what to do. That's not an age thing, not about new school, old school. It's just the people that are kind of always opposed to, they bark, they kind of like scoff at the idea of influencers. They, they, they think bloggers are overrated and vloggers are cringe. But this is the way... This is where the kind of influences go. This is where the attention is. They just have to kind of accept it. So if you're a kid that kind of knows that, I, I would much rather you kind of start your own thing, invest in yourself, work with your friends or people, or even people online. You don't have to have actual real friends to do it. Even you can do it on, on social. You can find people that kind of like fuck with you and I think you're cool and shit and just build your own sort of like ecosystem that way. And then once you've kind of earned the kind of uh, attention of the public in general and you have some i don't know you have numbers behind your back you have metrics you have kind of experience and skin in the game then why not go to the fashion industry if you want to if you want to do a kind of i don't know a quote-unquote anarchy sort of like um vibe and sort of like go in and sort of like disrupt the system then why not do it that way but it's i don't know i just i just find that very interesting the, the kind of things fashion people tend to kind of like jump on and kind of pick on and shit um that was interesting and then it was interesting also to see uh brian boy kind of out her and she kind of went into she kind of disappeared for a bit marissa abduma and then uh the other guy called is it mark right from zero three two one zero three two one c what's his name is it mark groaning mark groaning uh zero three two one c stylist what's his name again is it groaning yeah Zero three two one. Let me see if I can find it. Zero zero three two C. Sorry, my bad. My favorite magazine. I can't remember the fucking name of it. Uh, stylist. What's his name? Mark something, right? Um, let me find him on Instagram. Anyway, so she disappeared for a bit, right? 
uh, Mirish Avduma disappeared and kind of went into hiding. Um, and then, yeah, that's it. Mark Goering, 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 right? So she did disappear into hiding. And then this guy called Mark Goering, who's uh, I follow on Instagram, is fucking amazing. He posted it because he's always, he kind of dresses really well and shit. You might have known him. He's a guy with a kind of with a beard and a shaved head with a kind of like point, you know, the kind of weird pointy thing at the front, uh, hair kind of style wise. You would probably know him. And he post he made a picture about Marissa Abdunua. Uh, and on the picture, it's like a picture of her wearing a hoodie on a t-shirt. And on the on the hoodie, it says, "Hi, my name is Marissa Abdunua. I'm a racist. I'm a homophobe, and I'm transphobe." <laughs> it's like fucking hell. And it's got how many likes? Six thousand and three hundred and thirty, right? But obviously, she's back now. So it's interesting to see how long it takes for people that have been kind of outed in kind of via social media to come back out like on social media again. Do you know what I mean? So if you've, if you've been publicly shamed, how long does it take for you to kind of come back and say, I'm sorry guys. Um, and to kind of, you know, slowly creep out from under the rocks. And if we check her last post, it's basically been about just under a month, right? A, a, a few months, a few weeks short of a month. It's been a, yeah. Happened on January 23rd. We're now February 14th. So it's been just under a month, right, that she's kind of had to go into hiding. And I think it's interesting the way time works, isn't it, on social media, on the internet, right? Don't you find that interesting, how time works? Where, like, three weeks is like three years. It kind of feels like, because, I, what is that? Is that because of the amount of content that's just being put out by people in general or what we're consuming or or what? Because... I'm I'm sure in her head she probably thought you know what it's enough time to come out from under the woodworks I paid my dues I've said I'm sorry and I'm just interested to, to, to know because I read the book um so you've been publicly shamed by Mark Ronson and it sort of details uh that lady I forgot her name who kind of made that joke about um she's got she was on a plane leaving London or wherever it might have been somewhere coming back to Africa. I think she lives in Africa. No, she lives... Anyway, let's say she's living a plane somewhere in Europe and she's going to Africa. And while she's boarding the plane in Europe, she tweeted something along the lines of, I'm going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, haha. Ha. I'm only joking, I'm white or something like that, right? Like a, a funny, a sort of crash sort of joke, right? Funny crash joke, which I laughed at. I thought it was quite funny. But by the time she... Obviously, that's a, what, 11-hour flight or whatever it is. By the time she landed, right... The, kind, the the internet had gone wild. Someone, I don't know how. Again, this is like, this is what I go back to people just having their, their kind of finger on the outrage trigger, right? Someone somewhere found her tweet. She's not, she works for obviously a big company, but she's not, you know, she's not famous or anything. So she might have had a 100 followers on Twitter. Someone found her tweet and just blasted it all across social media and she got fucking ruined. So by the time she landed, she lost her job. Um, her parents and I don't know, her family and friends had like blown up her phone. She had a million notifications. It was just fucking obscene, right? She had to go into hiding. But I, I tend to think that she was a bit unlucky because it happened, it happened like early during the whole outrage kind of industry that we're kind of in now, right? Because I think there's been a real contrast in the kind of outrage. You can see a real contrast from... I don't know, the first accounts of sexual assault that kind of popped up since Harvey Weinstein to what happened with Aziz Ansari, right? You could see the kind of difference. Like, it wasn't a kind of, it wasn't as hard or as a kind of fierce as it was when the Harvey Weinstein news first came around, right? And we were hearing all these other people, people were like dropping like flies. It was, even with James Franco, to a certain extent, he kind of got, he kind of didn't get as blasted as he probably could have if it happened a couple of years prior to when it did happen or it allegedly happened. But I'm interested to know in general, like, what is the time scale of public outrage? When, how long do you have to hide when you say something fucked up, or when you say something people don't agree with? Because I, I'm sure there's a big, big, uh, there's a big group of people in Russia who kind of didn't think Marisa Duma said anything wrong. And if you read some of the comments in her um, posts so far, there's been loads of I've been reading some of the comments on Instagram posts, and you can see there's a real divide because there's a lot of arguments going on back and forth. People that are in team Miroslav and team people that are in team sort of like don't take the piss out of racists or, homo or homosexual people in general, right? But, um, sorry, don't take the piss out of people that are like, you know, a different colour from you or different sexuality or whatever it may be. You can see there's a real split in the camps, but you can tell there's like a, a lot of people saying, no, look, it happened a long time ago or not a long time ago, you know, it happened a while ago. She said, she said she's sorry, what more do you want? And that maybe is the question, isn't it? Because... You sort of think with these people that want to publicly shame someone, like for instance, imagine, imagine if you do something fucked up to a girl, right? 
uh, that she deems to be fucked up or in general, retrospective, it is fucked up. But it's a one-off occasion. Like you're a good guy or or you're a good person in general. Maybe you're a magazine or you're a brand. You do something fucked up to an employee, right? You, I don't know, you fire them without giving a reason. I don't know, whatever you do, something shitty, right? And the internet kind of calls you out on it, right? That That's a good thing, isn't it? Because everyone's aware, you're aware, it's bad, you fucked up. You say you're sorry, put your hands up. Now, what what now? Like, what next? Um, is Marissa Abduma a monster forever? Um... Is there a need to re-educate her? Um, does she get completely blacklisted for more fashion events? If she does, a, if she does attend these fashion events, what happens? If brands align with themselves with her, are they kind of endorsing what she's saying? There's loads of que- there's loads of questions there that I, I don't feel a lot of people are generally speaking about or want to speak about. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Some of the questions are not questions that the accused the, the accused. Or the victims of the of the kind of you know vitriol she's putting out there should be answering right. You shouldn't be going up to fucking trans people and asking them, hey, what do you think of someone? If someone says something too fucked up to you, what do you think the adequate punishment punishment should be? Right? Maybe it's not they they're too close to it to kind of give a fair punishment or whatever. But I'm interested to know what the next steps are because I think we're kind of heading towards the end of it. I think our outrage stuff it's kind of it's kind of dying down. And I think it's a good thing because we need to kind of get back to mending our society in general and kind of re-establishing what are the norms what are the rules what is what is good what is allowed and what's not allowed right and it can't be it can't be just free speech you can't it can't be a thing of like you can't say it can't be a blanket ban on don't say things i don't like right because that's ridiculous because you know as jordan peterson uh mentioned in the interview with kathy newman you kind of have to say wrong stuff in the conversation in order to know what is good to say like you have to you have to risk that Especially anyone would know that having anyone would know this when you start a new job or when you uh, go on holiday somewhere and you talk to someone that you don't know, right? You kind of fuck, you kind of fumble around in the dark. You know what I mean? You don't really know what you're doing. You kind of have to fuck around a bit until you kind of realize, okay, cool. Here's what this person likes to hear. Here's who I can speak to about X, Y, and Z. Here's who not to speak to about this and that. You kind of have to figure it out by speaking openly and be able to speak freely, right? To people that don't, I'm not going to judge you for what you're saying, right? Uh, because what you're saying in the moment might just be what you're saying. It might not be, there might not be any merit. There might not be anything valuable or worthwhile behind it. And even if you have fucked up ideas as well, I believe in a free market, man. Like, we should be able to, I think, in a free market, right, if you're a racist, you should be able to, or no, if you're a racist, right, you got a shop, you should be able to have a shop and be like, look, I don't accept anyone in here that ain't white. And the market should decide, okay, you're a fucking idiot and not go to a shop and then you're out of business. And then you learn, right, through the pain of having to go through to bankruptcy, losing your your house, whatever it may be. You learn through that kind of brutal experience. But to say that someone that has bigoted opinions cannot do this and that, I don't think that helps the situation. It kind of just buries it and takes it back underground. And then if you're not careful, that same person, because they've got, you know, poison and venom in their hearts and shit, they might draw in perfectly reasonable or rational people into their argument because they they also are being banned to not to say things or they're being told not to say things uh because it might hurt someone's feelings i don't think that's the right way to go about it so this is not probably not the same this is probably not an, an indication of what the mirrors are doing kind of thing went on because i think she's just being an idiot and she just comes from a, a nation or a place in europe that is kind of a bit backwards and they have a very conservative way of going about things. You know, she's from the East. She's from the Soviet bloc and shit. I kind of, I'm not surprised that she would say that. You know, someone from, from where she's from. Uh, the, say Her saying nigger in the post could give a shit about really. I'm not, I'm, I'm British. I'm not really that associated with that word really um, to a certain extent. But I can see where the offense will come from. But I do think there's a need to have a conversation or to have a conversation around what happens now, next going forward, right? So you've been publicly shamed. Now what sort of program needs to happen? Because we can't be going around just waiting for someone to say fucked up shit and then piling on them and then hoping they lose everything in order to learn. Because I don't necessarily think that's the right way to go about things either. You know, like the guy that has a racist shop, whatever, he shouldn't have to lose his shop in order to learn he shouldn't be racist. There should be many, there's many signals that he'll get throughout the period, throughout that time he's at his shop, before he even gets bankrupt, that will that should help him to not be racist anymore right there should be those there should be those warning signs so we need to get we need to make people realize what those signals are and kind of respond to them because getting to like 
you can't you can't just have one signal be the thing. It can't just be the one. It can't just be the shame and then like suddenly lose everything. I think that's always a bit. I always find that a bit fucked up. You know, like I'm sure Miss Aduma is probably not losing any sleep over it. She probably you know married well. Um, that's not you know not it's not a bad thing to say, but I'm probably sure she married well and she's done well for herself in her investments and her career and shit. Probably you know she's not hurting and shit, but you don't really want to see hear or see people getting you know fucked over by publicly shaming stuff in general. Um, because no one really learns that way by kind of like chastising them or pointing at them. Um, but with that being said, and publicly being shamed, right? And I need to, uh, I need to make a correction of stopping the ums as well. It's a bit difficult, but hey, I'm trying. Talking about publicly shaming people, have you seen the? You see what happened with uh, Logan Paul? The kind of update on it. Oh, I'm eating this Lindo shit. I should be, probably should be eating, but hey, fuck it. And you know, eating on the microphone is always a bit annoying, anyway, isn't it? But apologies. But if you're not aware, um, Logan Paul, the brother of Jake Paul, those two twin, not twin, the two brothers on YouTube, blonde guys that have a crazy following on there, right? Millions of subscribers between the both of them. And they just do like silly shit, right? Um, Jake Paul was more in the news. Early, I think it was in the news a lot last year because he bought that massive mansion in LA where he was doing crazy pranks, lighting shit on fire, breaking shit. Just general teenage dumbness, right? And his brother was the same. Atlantic sort of stuff, traveling the world, more so a world traveler sort of vibe. And then as lately they'll do these music video things, right? So he goes to Japan, does a does a video in Japan, you know, does his usual antics in Japan. But then he literally a video where him and him and his friends go in a suicide forest and film a guy, you know, that's obviously committed suicide earlier, hanging in the forest. And they try to turn it into some like um ask for help infomercial, but for the most part the the kind of video was like a, oh my god, look what we found, look what we stumbled upon. Do you know what I mean it, it was sort of like a, you could have, would you could have spoofed from Blair Witch? You know, like, it was it was like a bit slapstick, right? It wasn't, it didn't really have a serious message behind it. Um, they probably tried, they didn't they probably they, they did add a, a few hotline numbers at the end, and, 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 but for the most part, it was, it was you know, it, it felt a bit exploitive. Obviously, the internet, as I mentioned before, with their fucking finger on the trigger, this time warranted. Well, like, dude, what the fuck are you doing, right? But for the most part, his fans didn't see anything wrong with it because they're used to this sort of, like, level of outrage, right? If you're a fan of Logan Paul, you're not going to be shocked to him showing you a video of, of someone hanging in a suicide forest. It's not really that much of a big deal to you. So, but, so they didn't mind it, and it clocked up millions of views, and then after nine days or so, uh, YouTube finally reacted or something along those kind of lines, and, you know, I think pulled it from YouTube demonetized him, blah, blah, blah. No, sorry, pulling from YouTube, he lost a couple of sponsors here and there and he had to go into hiding publicly shamed because obviously this is something reprehensible. Then he hit, and then another story with him is that he went into hiding and I don't think, I'm not, I'm not sure how long he went into hiding for, but he kind of went on this big redemption tour where he was apologizing to everyone under the sun. Big Geordie on YouTube did a, a video about him where he was kind of like, you know, he kind of really, he went nuts, Big Geordie, because I think he's got experience of having suicidal thoughts and he's had loads of messages from his supporters who have also had that kind of um feeling and he kind of took it very personally and sort of like lambasted him in public which gained a lot more traction as well and kind of you know anyway in general because everyone hates him anyway so you can't be too you can't learn too much credence to those videos because in general no one really likes what he's doing because generally what the videos that Jake Paul and Logan Paul do appeal to like the lowest common denominator or in general just young really young kids right they don't really know anything better and I guess if you're 12 or 11 or 10 and you're seeing someone filming a, a dead man hanging in the forest, it is a bit like, oh my God, fuck, dude, look at what we saw. Do you know what I mean? Because I remember when I was young and we used to go into the forest sometimes in the park and stumble across a dead fox or some shit. It was fucking, do you know what I mean? It was like, whoa. It was a bit weird. Do you know what I mean? It was a bit like fucking weird and a bit like funny and whatever, weird and shit. So I'm, at, I, I'm sure if I had a smartphone back then, I would have done an obscene video, you know? poking at it, throwing stones, I don't know, whatever stupid shit you do when you're young, so it's, 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 it's normal that people that are on YouTube who are maybe a little bit older, probably the, past the age of 19 or 21, kind of look at him and think this guy's a fucking donut, because he kind of hangs out with little children, both of them are the same, right, they kind of hang out really, they hang, hang out with really young people, and they appeal to really young people, so it's kind of a little bit, it's really annoying that kind of, that, that person in general, right, and maybe as well, like without getting too kind of in the weeds with it, maybe because he kind of represents a kind of archetypal archetypal jock, right? He's kind of like the kid that 
would have bullied someone like a H3H in school, like a Logan Paul and Jake Paul, right? They look like the kind of person that would have bullied a H3H, right? If you know who he is on YouTube. So maybe that's where some of the kind of like um, resentment comes from, right? So kind of, it's a living, it's like, I'd, I'd, I nearly escaped you guys. I nearly ran away and found my little peaceful enclave on YouTube where all um, me and my fellow nerds, geeks, freaks, and people that um, live on the edges of society can kind of have this safe enclave that we can kind of, hang out in, be free, and not be judged. And then suddenly a jock decides to come in, all jockified out, right? Uh, blonde hair, ripped, loud, in your face, doing crazy stunts, millions of subscribers, super successful, merch, 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 link in bio. I guess it can kind of rub you up the wrong way. Especially if they do something that's like morally reprehensible, right? You kind of, it doesn't agree with your morals. Like how can you film someone that's committed suicide? That's a dead corpse, you fucking idiot. It's got a family. I get it. So he went on a big redemption tour. He tries to say sorry, sorry, sorry. And then he finally comes back, right, with a video that I kind of thought was funny. The kind of comeback video. He made a comeback video where he was sort of like, I don't know, crawling in the woods, right? Let me see if I can find it. I thought it was quite funny in general. He don't, not taking himself serious, right? Coming back. Let's see if it's the one. Is this the video? Hello. I'm sorry. Right, it's the one, right? Coming back, right? I'm sorry. I'll fast forward a bit now. Oh, let me see if you can hear it. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Yeah, so I kind of I kind of didn't mind that video, right? I kind of thought that was really funny. You know, like um obviously maybe not in in light of what's happened. He maybe might be in bad taste, right? Uh to make that video because what he did wasn't like I don't know, it wasn't it wasn't negligence, right? Jamie, it was just it was something really done in poor taste, right? And everyone kind of thought like if you could do that with all your friends around you, coming back to a hotel, editing a video, uploading it, adding captions and whatever titles and videos, and you think that's okay, what does that say about you as a human? So it, it's, it wasn't a cool thing to kind of, to it wasn't, a, it wasn't, he didn't take a risk and then fuck up. He did something reprehensible. Like generally everyone, in a, in a, if you interviewed 100 people on the street, 99, peop, 99 people would say, you know, that that's fucked up, you shouldn't do that, right? But I thought the video was what funny because he went on this big, apology tour that involved him sitting in a chair with this backlit room talking to whatever person he is and, and pretending he's crying and kind of interviewing so to kind of contrast that with like this is my real apology or my real coming out tour or whatever that was quite funny but then to for, for your first video back to be a video where you're seen um electrocuting a dead rat it's like dude man like what is wrong with this guy like in general or maybe what is wrong with society in general where people feel as if like maybe it's maybe it's i guess if you're that successful right if you're logan paul you made that much money on youtube and shit through ad revenue and merch and appearances and stuff you maybe think you're untouchable and especially since youtube have found it difficult uh to punish him or to kind of take any action against his channel right because youtube want to be a platform where free speech is allowed, right? So if you're a xenophobe, whatever, you can go on YouTube, make a channel, and other xenophobes can kind of hear you out, right? And that's what makes YouTube beautiful because they allow any voice to go in there and say things, right? Um, it obviously, it can't be hateful. It can't be, I don't know, it can't be, it can't just like violence and shit, but you can go in there and share your political or societal opinions with the world. Now, they, they, those videos now might not get monetized. You might not have any sponsors. You might not earn any money and shit. But if you want to spread your message, you can get it out there. And now and then it's up to the free market, the, by the public, to decide whether or not what you're saying is true, is uh, governing facts, or you're just talking at your ass, right? It's up to the public to kind of like decide. You know, you're at the mercy of the public, for instance, which makes it amazing. So if you're someone like Logan Paul, if if you if you're YouTube and you got someone like Logan Paul's one of your biggest stars and he's doing things that a lot of people don't find tasteful. That doesn't represent everyone though, because each video is uploading. Like that video I just played now has like 15 million views, right? 15 million. 
It's got 1 million likes and 350,000 um, downvotes. Obviously, that's like, you know, above 10% of unlikes, but still, it's got 50 million views. Now, don't get me wrong. It's because, you know, he's in the news. Uh, he says some fucked up shit. People want to see what he's going to do next. I get it. That's probably, that might add to the views, whatever, but he's got 50 million views on one video. Now, it, of course, I might find it tasteless, but other people might enjoy it. So I guess if you're YouTube, it's a very difficult situation to be in. Like, what do you... Oh, sorry, play this video and stop this. What do you do? Generally, like, what do you do next? Like, what happens next? So they kind of decided to demonetize his, his, his account in general, right? And say, like, you know what, fuck this. We're going to demonetize your account so you won't be able to make any more money. Um, and I guess... I don't know, like, what does that do to someone like a Logan Paul? Like, because I look at it and I'm like, he's, he's obviously not going to learn his lesson because I think he's just decided, right, that, you know what, fuck this. I know that Japan video was fucked up, but I generally found, he's probably thinking, no, you know what, I find that funny. Me and my friends who are beside me find that funny and we thought other people would do it too. And before he got taken down, the YouTube videos proved it. So I'm pretty sure he is thinking that he is probably untouchable. That, and if he wanted to, and the, and the weird thing is that if he wanted to, right, if he decided to take his viewers to another platform and start his own video hosting website, he could probably do pretty well. He could probably he could probably siphon off a lot of his audience. Maybe not all 16 million subscribers, but he could take a huge chunk of, of people off of YouTube onto his own platform. Or even if he decides to upload his videos onto Facebook. I'm not sure if he does it onto Facebook, but... Let me double check his Facebook account. But if he uploaded, if he does the video, if he does support his videos up on Facebook, I'm pretty sure he could do well too. So it's a very strange position to be in if you're on YouTube or if you're society in general because you've got this one person who generally has all the power, like for real, has all the power. Now what do you do? Do you know I mean if you're on YouTube? Now what do you do? Or as a public, what do you do in general? Like what do you do with this person? Um, yeah, it's just been interesting. I don't know, man. It's, 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 it's been a it's been an interesting ride, man. To see someone that's generally got generally has all the power and the the actual platform is trying to like you know rein him in and it's like it's sorry man you just can't it's a bit shitty or stuff he does i'm not really into it it's not stuff that i'd any i'd watch it's like don't get me wrong they're not they're not, they're not the same sort of level of outrage but you know for me it's like a ksi sort of thing it's like it appeals to like young kids and whatever i'm not really interested in that sort of shit so i get it man but you know what can you do dude so now Logan Paul's been demonetized and the world is ha a happier place, I guess, right? Yeah. That whole, like, laughing at other people's pain as well. I'm not really a fan of either. I don't really like that sort of approach myself. Um, what else I want to speak about? Blah, 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 on my list. Uh, 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 uh. Oh. Did you guys see the Supreme Spring Summer 2018? What do you think? Because... I'm not that much of a fan of it. But that being said, I've saved loads of things on my hard drive of things that I wouldn't mind buying, right? <laughs> it's always the case with Supreme. You say you're not a fan of it, but when we see it in public or see people wearing it, you're like, oh my God, I'd wear that, I'd wear this, I'd wear that. Now, generally, ever since I bought Supreme, which might have been, I don't know, I don't know, 2003, I don't know whenever I started buying it, right? I've always said, which it probably isn't a big. I'm probably not saying nothing outright. I'm probably not saying something. Um, what I'm saying isn't that radical, right? But by and large, autumn winter is much better than spring summer, right? I've never been a big fan of spring summer supreme, but part of the reason why because when I used to buy supreme, I was fat as fuck. And back then, a Supreme XL wasn't what a Supreme XL is now. A Supreme XL now is much more forgiving. Back then, a Supreme XL was more of a, a big large. Then when they started to gain more traction within the European market, they then update. I remember there was, a, there was a t I remember there was a period where they updated their sizes because I remember they used to a lot of their sizes used to used to be kind of like Japanese or Asian sort of like sizes. So it was like a large, but a Japanese large. You know, it was kind of it was kind of a lot. A lot more narrow than it would be if it was a European sort of large, which kind of helped things a little bit, right? So I was able to kind of wear some of the outwear because I remember before when I used to buy some jackets or varsity jackets and shit, I couldn't button some of them up. Like they they were it was an XL, but it generally fit like a bloody small, a kind of large medium. Do you know what I mean? So that might play a lot into the that might play a lot more into my opinion that spring 
all winter is better than spring summer because generally the jackets, the all winter stuff, I could always kind of fit into, or it was bigger coats and hoodies and shit. But by and large, I always like all winter. But this collection is quite cool. There's some pieces in here that I generally would like to wear. I think the first piece that I kind of saw that I, I thought it was a nah straight away was the thing with the hooks on it, right? The nylon, the nylon turn, turnout jacket with uh, zip closure and lobster, lobster storm hooks or lobster hooks. I'm not a fan of those, that of that jacket or that style in general. There's been a few of them popping up on the runways. Uh, a lot of them are, uh, ju judging by the colour, because the one I'm looking at is orange, I think a lot of them kind of, you know, they have, must have that kind of naval theme, but I've seen a lot of brands do them in uh, sort of like um firefighter jacket, kind of like, you know, security jacket types, whatever. So I'm not really a fan of that. But I do like this long coat, which is the infantry jacket. It's fucking awesome. I fucking love that jacket, right? It comes in a camo and a white, is it? Is it an all white? Yeah, it's an all white as well. But that's that's really nice. I really like that. I'm just going to go through some stuff that I kind of like in the Supreme Collection. Um, as non-mundane as that may sound, but you know, we all love Supreme out here. The the denim jacket with the patches on it is amazing. Um, I'm also going to make a, a quick note. I'm not sure everyone else is aware of this, but I, I think Supreme denim jackets are severely underrated. I tried one on a few seasons ago, which I didn't buy. But I really did like the feel of it. Like, I think it might have been a corduroy one or something like that. I, I like the feel. I like the shape of it. I've seen a few people wear, wear Supreme denim jackets that they've had for a few seasons. That they, You know, after a few wears, they, they look fucking amazing. Because I remember there was a period where I used to think my staple denim jacket would be a, a denim jacket from Acne or like a Visum denim jacket and stuff. But I really do think Supreme un, are underrated in their denim jacket. They make a great, great denim jacket that you can kind of wear with all different type of things. And this one that they have with patches is so so good it's definitely a jacket I'd, I'd be up for wearing with um you know the kind of stuff that i've kind of got in my wardrobe now would work really really well with that jacket so that's really nice um a weird one one my, that i like that you probably wouldn't think i like is the gradient puffer jacket it sort of comes in a weird um kind of lgbt flag color like both of them i think i don't know if, if people are going to call it that maybe if you put them together uh gradient puffy jacket that's fucking cool as fuck uh, the one that goes from yellow to green is really nice. And the one that goes from blue to orange is super cool. So that's a, a little piece that I definitely recommend. Um, the leather jacket is amazing. The studded arc leather jacket is so, so cool. It's interesting, it's interesting to see that leather jacket isn't made in collaboration with Scott anymore, which is interesting. Um, I guess maybe the the Scott partnership is something that they do as part of a capsule or something. Maybe I'm not too sure. But that's kind of an in-house thing. I don't see another label on the inside of it. Nope, no other label. It's just to see what kind of material it is in general in, in, in real life. Um, so that's really nice. Uh, what else do I like here? Mm -mm 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 -mm. The Vasi jacket's pretty good as well. Um, I'm not really a, a fan of wearing something that says Supreme on the front or whatever. But the Vasi jacket, if that's your kind of vibe, is something that might be a good buy. And the teal sort of colour, Tiffany colour is a really nice one to go for. Um, there's a grey leather vest with eagles on the front. That is a, definitely going to be a good buy if you're into that kind of biker look. I could definitely see someone like Post Malone definitely wearing something like this. Um, which looks really, really nice. And again, no collaboration with Scott, um, which is interesting as well. So they kind of bring all their leather stuff in-house. So that might mean it might be cheaper. Um, what else we have here? There's a good collaboration with this guy called uh, Lee Queens. I've even pronounced his name, Lee Quenis. He done a, a denim jacket with some graffiti on it, which is amazing. So like an all over print, which is really really cool. I, f I definitely think that might be something that you see a lot of people on Instagram kind of buying and putting on there. It looks, it looks very very good. A few nice, uh, tape seam rain jackets that are always really. That always are really popular. A lot of people always like uh, a nice utility vest or fisherman jackets. I probably I don't know how people call them. And then a few nice short sleeve shirts. There's a there's a really really good one actually. Um, that's got li lilies on it, um, which is fucking beautiful. Which I think a lot of people should end up copying. Uh, what else I like? Oh, and the suit. That's something that came out of the blue. No collaboration either. I think the last. 
No, the last suit. Or the last great suit that I thought was really nice is one they made with uh, Adam Kemmel. Uh, the now defunct Adam Kemmel brand from New York. And then they did a few with Comme des Garçons. I don't know who else they did a couple with. Maybe Sasquatch. But now they've got an in-house suit. So uh, a, a full suit by Supreme. Now, I'm not sure whether or not they're going to sell it as a uh, as one piece or whether you buy it separately. But it's interesting to see who ends up picking up this suit and who ends up wearing it in general. Because I think it looks pretty good. Quite a relaxed fit from what the model was wearing. So interesting to see what that looks like in public, in real life. Sorry, in public. So you've got that in green, in peach, and in black. Um, you've got a lot of the Martin Luther King wear, which, I don't know. Nice, don't get me wrong, but, you know, I don't know. It's a bit funny, isn't it, wearing that sort of garb. It's like people that wear, like, Che Guevara shirts and, like, Malcolm X t-shirts and that. It's a bit like, eh, we get it, you know? I understand. You're politically aware. Chill the fuck out, mate. Um, so maybe a pass on that, but as a as a shirt, it looks quite good. And then, uh, and kind of last one, oh, last couple of ones, uh, the hockey shirts are obviously really good, but I can't really wear hockey shirts anymore nowadays. You always feel like a bit of a kid wearing those kind of things. Um, you feel like you have, you kind of feel like you have to have a yo-yo in your back pocket when you're wearing a hockey shirt. So that's probably not something I'm going to do anytime soon. Um, and then loads of great shorts. Obviously, festival season coming up. That would be great. And more importantly, forget the shorts, accessories. I think everyone's speaking about the ping pong machine, which is, you know, it goes back to the absurdities of, supreme merch you know they make the best sort of like you know add-on gifts you can't really call a a pinball machine an add-on gift because i'm sure it'll be like two thousand dollars plus but it's an interesting thing to have in someone's house i guess whatever um hopefully the kids that buy it actually use it and not just use it as like a you know quote-unquote something to spray their man fluids all over but i'm pretty sure that'll end up happening um and then a nice lighter, that looks really good. A good baseball mask, a nice axe. But overall, overall, like, yeah, an all, an all right collection, spring, summer. Always preferred all winter stuff, but I'm sure I'm in the minority and they will do very, very well this season once again. Um, but I definitely envision seeing a lot of the Martin Luther King wear all over Instagram. Definitely going to see that leopard jacket everywhere. That sort of like LGBT puffer jacket is going to be everywhere. The patches jacket, the patches jacket is going to be everywhere. The one with the spray paint is going to be everywhere. The utility jacket is going to be everywhere. And obviously the granddad jumpers are going to be everywhere too. So those are the obvious things. I can definitely see a lot of the people on Instagram and shit wearing. So yeah, that is Supreme Collection Spring Summer 2018. I think the first drop is tomorrow, judging by what they're saying on the websites, right? Is it tomorrow... I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow anyway. Du, 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 drop list. Yeah, first first drop is tomorrow. Loads of bags, a couple of decks. Anything hype? Yeah, uh, that sort of like faux fur, repeater bombers out. The infantry jacket, which I like, is out. Uh, the leopard, the kind of Scott A2 is out. Sort of like leopard style one. Yeah, so there's a lot of good stuff coming out in the first round, actually. I'm not going to lie. Some nice shorts as well. So let's see what sells out first. Okay, so that is part one. I'm going to come back on the other side in part two and play a track in between. Just to mix things up a little bit. So I'll see you guys on the other side. Hello, hello, hello. Hello again, what's up, what's up, what's up? Um, for those of you listening on YouTube, apologies for the little break in communication there. I did play a song in between, but then I realised that I can't upload those songs onto YouTube because YouTube's a bitch and you have to pay people to clear songs that you want to play on the old tube of you, which is annoying, but, you know, I, I kind of get it. I understand what they're kind of going around, what they're kind of getting at, sorry. Um, so, yeah, uh, this is the second half of the podcast. I'm going to carry on for a few more minutes and talk about some more topics that I kind of wanted to expound upon. And then I will leave you guys to carry on your lovely, beautiful day. Um, so one last thing I wanted to speak about was my DJ set that I played last week. So I'm in this position where I've now become the de facto sort of like um, dropout guy, right? If anyone cancels or drops out or doesn't turn up, they kind of call me to go down and DJ. And seeing as a bar that I DJ at the Heathcote and Star is like, I don't know, a half an hour walk, maybe a 10 minute, 20 minute bus ride. Maybe a bit short. Anyway, it's, it's pretty near to where I live, right? I can, I can walk there in like half an hour. 
So I generally just scoot over there and I kind of get it done. And because I'm in a much better, because I have a much, how would you say? Because I'm approaching DJing uh, with more, prof- no, I won't say professionalism, but I'm taking it seriously. So it's a hobby that I really enjoy and I want to get better at it, right? So if I kind of look at DJing like um, if I was into archery or if I was into bow hunting and shit. I wouldn't necessarily say I want to become the world champion at bow hunting, but I want to get... T- I want to get to a proficient enough level that allows me to enjoy the skill that I'm doing for a prolonged period of time without any assistance, right? So DJing is the same sort of vibe for me. I want to just be able to play music that I like, music that I love. Some people, or even the music that some people request of me in a in a good enough fashion that no one is going to be like, oh my God, this guy's horrible, kick him out. Do you know what I mean? That's because usually that's... That I would say is the pinnacle of like a poor performance, right? Not the fact that you think you played shit, but the fact that other people think you played shit. Because I think that internal shitness thing, no one will ever understand it, right? As being as a creative or being someone that's doing work in general. I wouldn't say it's even a creative endeavor. I think it's someone that does anything with their hands or anything using their mind that they kind of put forth into the world. And then it kind of doesn't go the way you want to go. It, that feeling like no one could ever understand it. So I kind of want to just do it really well and have people respect me that, and have people respect the way that I do it, right? Like, okay, this guy's all right, you know? It might not be my kind of music, but I like it. So at the moment at the Heath Coast Star, I've got the role of being a kind of de facto cancellation dude. So whenever someone drops out, they call me, which I'm perfectly happy with. Because if you would have told me 18 months ago that I was playing in a bar anyway, in general, regardless of where it might have been, uh, DJing was on my own without having a, a proper club night where I had to promote it and... Because the difference that I have, because I remember I mentioned it to somebody the other day when they sort of mentioned, oh, like, I missed uh, I missed your club nights. Like, I wish you kind of would start that stuff again. And I kind of have no interest in doing it again. Like, I wouldn't mind doing, like, a showcase of some sort, like a one-off showcase, I don't know, every couple of, every, I don't know, twice a year, you know, maybe finding people on SoundCloud that I kind of like or just friends in general, whatever, and kind of putting them out there. And kind of like, you know, creating an event that allows them to play for a prolonged period of time in an interesting space or whatever. That might be good. But I'm also quite selfish in the respect that I don't think... I don't think now is the time for me to showcase anyone else when I'm still trying to improve myself. And I also think that being a good promoter requires a lot of work. A lot more work than you'd think being a good DJ does. Because... With the promoter brain, you have to. It's kind of like a left and right side of your brain, isn't it? It's like super creative, and also you have to be. You have to have your business head on. You have to kind of get that screwed on because you can't. You can't have a a, a completely avant garde lineup that no one is familiar with because then you won't make any money at the door, and you know, and the bar pass, the bar manager, or the event manager will be angry that you you didn't fill up the venue, and you can't have a place full of big hitters because then you won't make any money at the door so it's a really delicate balance and there's a constant there's that constant naggy feeling in the back of your head that you kind of have never done enough to kind of promote it because as most of you guys know like you know there's a million and one events happening in most major cities around the world right like um don't, i don't care where you are like if, if there's a if there's a good if there's a good kind of infrastructure for nightlife and a good little scene of young people doing creative and cool things there's going to be a plethora of events, right? People are putting them around and there's people are putting them on every weekend and there's only a certain amount of people that can go to these events, right? You're, you're kind of only appealing to the, I don't know, the 0.0.0% of like people that are into that kind of music. So you kind of have to come at it fucking hard. You have to kind of do it well. You can't just like do it willy-nilly. And it's even more so difficult where I am, where I'm living currently now in kind of Leighton, so Stratford area, because it hasn't really, they haven't really cultivated, there, there is no scene here just yet, right? There's good bars, good restaurants, good whatever, but there's no real heavy hitter creatives kind of like living and roaming around here. Like people kind of like maybe live here for cheap rent and then kind of like duck out and go to other parts of other parts of London that are a bit cooler, like, I don't know, trendy parts of East London, South London, whatever it may be. So for, so I'm not really in that kind of space of promoting. And in general, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit of a drag, man, having to promote a night all the time. I prefer DJing. Um, I make my flyer. I put it out on across all my social media platforms. I think the other few times I've done it, I've, I've been able to, like, run some ads against it on Facebook and stuff like that just to kind of drum up some eyes on it. It's not it's not necessarily a thing of, like, I need to get the place full. I just want to put the eyes. I want to get eyes on my name so people can, can associate me with playing music out 
on like fucking CDJs and shit. So that's pretty good. So um, yeah, I'm happy being the de facto replacement dude. And I think I'm happy now because I've, I'm always taking a, I'm kind of taking a macro, micro approach to things, right? So I'm kind of seeing it for, I'm kind of comparing where I was a couple of years ago to where I am now, right? A couple of years ago, I was getting, I don't know, the odd gig here and there. I might play four times a year, right? Or three times a year, if I'm lucky. Now, if I look at my listings on Resident Advisor, because I, I kind of did this selfishly, right? Not, um, So I kind of had a record of everywhere I played, because I think it's quite nice as well to go on DJ's profiles on Resident Advisor and kind of see where they're playing next, blah, blah, blah. Because I think that's, it's, I just, I know, I just find it quite cool. It's like when you listen to podcasts with comedians and they're like listing their dates of where they're going to be at. I always find that really cool. Do you know what I mean? Like you're going to be at all these places, like, you know, spreading your message or, you know, showcasing your creativity is fucking awesome. But also I did it, I kind of listed myself on Resident Advisor for purely selfish reasons. Uh, so I can have like a record of where I played and also to kind of like uh, ground me a little bit so I can appreciate what I've done in the last couple of years. Because if I look at my listings from like 2016 or 2015, there wasn't that much going on there, right? Like, I don't know, in, between those two years, I might have played six times. And if I just look at last year alone, right, I played, I played literally, I played basically every month of the year. Sometimes I played twice in a month, um, which is, so let's say maybe I might have played that 15 times uh, last year, right, which to a professional DJ is not, is not nothing, right, because I'm pretty sure the big hitters could cover 15 gigs and maybe it's a span of two weeks, especially if it's festival season or if it's just like beef season now in general, I'm pretty sure they could do that. But for me, I found it, not f I find it very, I find it very humbling, you know, like, oh my God, I've, I've come a long way, dude, and you can, and I can tell I'm improving because things are sticking a lot more than they used to be, right, because I was playing a little bit at the Birds, which is other, other bar in Leytonstone, and I was going okay, but I wasn't doing as, as good as I kind of could have done there, then they had like three bar manager changes during the time I was there, and it kind of, things kind of got lost in the mix, and I kind of got left behind, and no one really kind of picked me up and, and brought me along with, with a new regime, which is fine, you know, everyone's got their, you, you kind of have to help out your own friends and stuff, and I didn't really know any of the guys out there, but looking at it from just a purely uh subject i mean what you call it kind of removing myself from the situation i'd say maybe i didn't do a good enough job to kind of you know warrant me not being ignored but i've done a i've done a much better job now like do you know what i mean like in terms of how i've approached stuff in terms of not bringing a midi player not bringing my or not bringing my mac laptop using a usbs using cd sometimes playing vinyl i'm really trying to approach it i'm really trying to approach it in a more professional manner in the hope that i get better and just improve and see where i take it uh it would be amazing don't get me wrong to you know do this full time that'd be like the the dream and that'd be fucking so cool but i would really like just to say just to kind of be a, re a, a very very high level hobbyist right and then from there see if i can break into kind of being like a i don't know a semi-professional and then from there if it becomes if i'm have the possibility to take it professional then why not it's looking likely that if i want to do that i would have to start producing right because uh if you look at any successful dj out there or anyone that's smashing it to like in a real big way they all make music whether it's edits remixes or their own original tracks everyone makes music as a way to kind of like uh boost their dj profile it kind of always helps to have like a smash hit record and everyone's gonna book you to play stuff play, play places you might not be good but people will book you and obviously that's a good little cash grab you can kind of go on and just like you know do your little 18 months of uh touring on the back of this big single and then hide in your studio again make some more tracks and then come back out again so that could be a way or you could just do like a bend ufo style and just commit yourself to just dj only and not make any songs but i don't necessarily think uh i want to do that i would like to lend my i, I would like to try to produce tracks and see what they sound like you know because i do listen to a lot of music i, I do go out fairly often um i would say i have a good ear because you know to be a dj you have to have some sort of like good ear for music in general so i'd like to see what happens when you put that to work and you try and make your own music now it might fall it might i might, might fall flat on my face and the stuff i might i might i make might be fucking garbage but i'd like just to just to, i'd like to just try and to hear what it sounds like just one time you know what i mean so that's the kind of uh that's what I'm aiming to do in the next uh, few months. And um, yeah, I'm grateful, man. Super grateful. The set itself went really well. Everyone was really happy on my set. I played really, I played well. Um, if you take, 
if you take people's word as gospel. But sometimes, you know, I'm always a bit dubious about when people say, oh, we're going great set because most of the time people that are telling you this are fucked off their heads, right? They're having a great time. Um, endorphins are flowing. Uh, they're just feeling amazing, right? Uh, but usually I like to take the opinion of sometimes the bar staff. I remember the first couple of times I played there, uh, I didn't really get a warm feeling from them. Like it might have been because I'm, I was I was new or because I didn't play well, but I could definitely see a marked difference between when I first started there and now. Like you know, what I mean? like they invite me to have drinks after after I finish my set and just hang around. And you know, we we I don't know, we joke around. Everyone's really happy. They compliment me again when whilst everyone's gone and everyone's sobering up. So I think I think it's going to go okay. I think I just need to stick with it and just improve, but. I definitely say if you're if you're out there and you're I don't know thinking about DJing or whatever I really would recommend you trying to get a hold of if you can if your friends have them or not try and get a hold of a pair of CDJs and try and play on them like out properly uh, try and download a set playlist or a collection of songs onto a USB stick and play play around with a with a CDJ or put some songs onto a CD or to CDs and play with those and just fuck around with them because. There is a big difference between playing on CDJs and playing with a MIDI player. And that's, this is coming from somebody, or playing with a controller, this is coming from somebody who kind of scoffed at the idea of people like saying, oh, controller guys aren't real DJs, whatever. I thought that was stupid, but I can I get what they mean now because having the options to play anything you want. Now, don't get me wrong. When you have a controller, you can make a playlist, right? You can make a crate on Serato and like just play the songs that you want to play, right? But... You have the there's that the, you always have the option that you can always play whatever you want, right? So you there there's no you have no uh, you have too many options, right? You, you it's that classic Tim Ferriss thing that I always talk about. You're being paralyzed by analysis, sort of thing, or you've been par- or the, the wealth of options is paralyzing your your option to choose one. But when you play with the USB sticks or the playlist, you have like I don't know sixty songs right you might have them in order like sometimes like i do like i will sometimes like i put my playlist in order of the songs of how i want them to play during the night but then when i get there i might just completely change my mind and play them back to front or play them the other way i don't know just pick and choose but i only have 60 songs so you really have to make it work and 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 that 60 song limit really makes you it kind of pushes the boundary of your creativity you kind of skirt on the edges because you're having to like think on the fly you're having to like interpret what's going on the dance floor what people are requesting what people are not requesting so i'd say it's, it's a lot lot harder to do than it is playing on the controller i i guarantee it like yes you still have to mix well because people always say our oh, controllers you you can just sync or whatever but you still have to you know there's has to be a flow in the set you're playing but overall cdjs are far superior far superior mode of playing music out than the uh, controllers and i've noticed as i mentioned before that when you're playing on cdjs or you're playing on vinyl people are a lot more patient with you right they give you a lot more chances they allow you to fuck up or to try things because they know you've only got those songs there you don't have anything more but i've noticed whenever i had a laptop there was a there was, there was like a there was like an underlying this there was an, an underlying uh how do you describe it an underlying what's the word there was an underlying sense of, there was a, a, a level of disregard that they had for me as a DJ when I played with uh, a controller. Like, ugh, whatever, like, just play this. Do you know what I mean? Like, they didn't really respect what I was doing because they saw a laptop and me pressing buttons and they immediately associated that with what they could do. Like, I could do that. Just play this song, innit? Just play it now. What's the problem? They didn't really get that there was a set of flow going on. When they see you uh, struggling to mix uh trying to beat match something uh trying to select a song off the cdjs they can tell you're trying to craft something right but sitting behind a laptop is really difficult to see you can't really tell if the person is trying or not trying you don't know like that you you just see someone pressing keys on a keyboard it doesn't really i don't know it doesn't really bode that well which is which might explain why people in live performances with laptops I've noticed anyway, there's a lot more analog mati- analog uh, equipment being used with, with DJs who play live with laptops and shit with Ableton. They use like massive, 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 massive mixing boards and I don't know, other sort of like audio equipment. Because that, I guess if you're an, uh, a punter and you're looking at it from the, from the dance floor, looking up and seeing this guy with a laptop glowing on his face and this massive tray of knobs and buttons this little machine that makes all these weird sounds it kind of looks like he's doing something right but if he's just standing there with like a tiny midi keyboard and his laptop 
you I don't know, it wouldn't have the same effect, would it? I think so anyway, it's just me personally saying it, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'm gonna pay off the mark, but I really would implore you if you're a DJ and you're trying to get yourself out there. By all by all by all means, uh practice on a controller at home and shit, but once you go out Try your best to leave that controller at home and play on whatever system that those guys have there. Whether it's vinyl and you've only got a, sh a few shitty pieces of uh, charity shot vinyl that you bought a long time ago. Or whether it's CDs and you have to burn your own CDs. I, I really, really would encourage you to uh, try to play whatever equipment they have in a bar and just see how it goes, man. And you, I'd rather, now I'd rather die playing like the DJs I look up to rather than, you know, uh, being safe and having options to play like, I don't know. I must have like 30,000 songs on my iTunes, like be an option to play that shit. Cause I never play, I can't, I can count on one hand the times I've played a really banging set on my controller out. Like usually it's because I, I play my CDJs that I play like a much better set. So I definitely, or these CDJs that they have in, in store in a bar. So I definitely recommend that you try and do that going forward. Um, that's about it really about the CD DJs. What else I want to speak about? Um, I just finished reading uh, 12 Rules for Life by uh, Jordan Peterson, actually. I'm going to grab my copy now. It's on the table. I smashed through this in a couple of weeks. The cover is absolutely battered. I, I realised, actually, when I went on social or checked the Jordan Peterson subreddit, that a lot of people got their copy of their of their 12 Rules for Life. It comes with a, a sort of, a, how do you call it? Like a, was it a PVC? I don't know, like a, like a vinyl cover, right? And mine doesn't. Mine isn't vinyl. Mine's like paper. So, and it stains super hard. So every time I've kind of used it in a bar or whatever or in a cafe, it's got loads of stains. It hasn't got the ring on the cup on it, but it's definitely got you know some few scuffs and bumps on it. But man, I don't care because I love, I love, I like the look of torn up or beat up books anyway. In general, that's my kind of vibe. And this book was fucking amazing. So, uh, credit to Jordan Peterson for this. And I'm definitely going to use the rules of the 12 rules of life as a framework to how i want to kind of live my 2018 i know i mentioned before at the beginning of the year that i wasn't that fond of goals anymore and i went to kind of leave myself a little bit a little bit out I, I went to kind of let the experiences of life kind of take me the direction they need to be but i've i've realized having listened to loads of jordan peterson lectures lately that i think the reason why i was doing that is because i was afraid of failure like I didn't want to fail, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to have a intrinsic aim. I didn't want to put it out there that I want to do this, that, and that, because if I don't do it, then I know for sure that I fucked up, right? But as I've, as I've kind of been, uh, as I've kind of been uh, looking at it a bit more deeply, I've kind of realized that a lot of my successes, especially if I look back, even this is a really shit example, but if I look back at how well I did in school, right? Because I was always, I was always a good, I was always a good academic student but I wasn't actually a good student right so teachers wouldn't actually enjoy me being in a classroom because I was distracting and I talked too much and I was super hyperactive but I was generally a good student when it acad academic side right? right I did good with my grades I kind of revised and shit but when I look at the times that I did really well in exams I always had a real aim like I, especially if I was revising late because that usually was my case especially until I got to about I don't know my last year of school like year 11 when I was 16, I always revised really late. I always tried to chunk things in. But I really, I usually did well when I was chunking with a specific aim. I was like, okay, cool. I've got six weeks left until the exam. And I want, the most I can get being realistic is a B. I'm going to aim for like a B plus and see what I do, see what happens. And I usually would get the B or I'd get a C, but I had a target. The times I just went, with it in and just tried to fly, fly off the seat with my pants, that's when I get surprised I'll get an E like I did in math sometime, right? So, Sometimes having a goal, as scary as it can be, because sometimes you have to, it's the realisation that you, you know, like you're, you're, commit, you're kind of promising yourself not to be a loser. And then once you, and, then with the, and you know that you might have the possibility of being a loser. So you don't want to do that to yourself, right? But sometimes I think having a goal is important because it at least aligns you or at least puts you on course to where you should be going. And as Jordan Peterson mentioned a few times, like along the way, you'll find, along the way, you'll find meaning, right? You'll find something that kind of makes you happy or something that kind of fills you up or that keeps you your mind activated or occupied whatever the the phrase may be so i'm kind of revisiting that and i'll kind of think after i finish because i haven't done it yet but i want to do the self-authoring program by jordan peterson too it's like a it's like an online program that allows you to kind of like take stock and accountship of your life and kind of like spec out what you want to do in the next few years because 
I think I've I think I've realized something. I remember when I used to read loads of self help books back when I was in school, right? Because I've always been on this tip, right? So so I've been reading these kind of books for a long, long time. But it's only lately, in the last few years, that I've kind of been putting them into practice. Because as per usual, I was the kind of person I just would read stuff, get rah rah rah, and then kind of like forget about it a week later. But now I'm using these books to kind of like mold me into the person I kind of want to be, right? But I remember in the beginning that there was used a lot of these people, whether they're self help uh, authors, whether they're preachers or pastors who always uh, who always used to implore their audience to write shit down like write down your goals what you want to do next year goal setting goal setting goal setting goal setting i remember that being a big thing it used to always annoy me it was like why am i goal setting when i know what i want to do i know it i've got it in my head i know what i want to do but having read john peterson's books and kind of listened to a lot of like clinical psychology stuff in general on youtube and other lectures i've realized that there is real power in writing something down that's why everyone that's why most people in that kind of space are encouraging people to journal like i saw the author ryan holiday who's uh known for the book obstacles away and who was a kind of a, a former head of marketing at american apparel when they were they were doing all that mad madness they were doing there right they always implore people to journal, right? And the idea of writing something down is similar to the idea of me kind of like speaking out loud right now on a podcast. I kind of use this as sort of like a, a self, a self, a way of me, uh, a, a kind of self therapy, right? And sometimes journaling and writing something down, that cognitive exercise of like what's in your brain, you know, sketching it out on a bit of paper. You, I remember when I was in school, anyway, in general, I, it used to stick in my head more. I used to remember it more when I wrote it down. So I, what I do on purpose is that if there's an answer I wanted to, if there was a particular paragraph I wanted to write in an English essay, I would write it out like 10 to 20 times because there was, there was something about that motor memory that I would, once I got into the exam hall and I saw those words, it would trigger my hand to write out that response again. So... There is something very powerful about writing things down or, and having a plan, having something that you want to aim for. So with this book, The 12 Rules of Life, it kind of already gives you a rough framework because it's 12 rules. And also within each rule, it kind of implores you to kind of seek out your own way of applying it in your own life, right? And there's loads of bits in here that I've kind of highlighted that I kind of want to use as a way to kind of guide myself and align myself. And and it's something I've been doing a lot lately now, like highlighting bits that kind of like interest me that I can kind of like read back and kind of like, you know, take note of and sort of maybe apply it in later parts of my life. So that's the kind of big, I'd say, change. I'm definitely going to be setting goals for this year in terms of what I want to do and where I kind of want to be. Um, I'm trying to find, should I find like a little quote I can read from here that might be of interest? You should check it out, really. You know who Jordan Peterson is. I hope you do anyway. So Google Jordan Peterson and you, and you might find it out. Um, oh, this is a good quote, actually. Uh, after all, if you're not the leading man... Oh, let me wipe my nose properly. After all, if you're not the leading man in your own drama, you're a bit player in someone else's and you might as well be assigned to play a dismal, lonely, tragic part. So that's obviously, you know, especially nowadays where everyone's kind of glued on social media and... You're always trying. You're always judging your successes uh, in comparison to what someone else is doing in your space, who might be a bit further along, which is obviously incorrect, right? It's akin to footballers around the world judging themselves against what Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo are doing. You can't do that. They're the outliers. There's always going to be people who perform like, like at an obscene level, right? Like outside of our little periphery. But people within the middle are pretty good too. Like. Tony Cruz isn't Cristiano Ronaldo, but he's a pretty good player. So it's like, you know, what do you want to be? Tony Cruz or Cristiano Ronaldo? Like, what are you more likely to be? Or what could you aim to be? You know, right now, you can probably aim to be a Tony Cruz, one of the, you know, a very highly rated player around the world. But, you know, there's only, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo or those kind of marquee players only come around every other decade or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's not something to aim for. And even if you're not that player, it doesn't mean you haven't made it. You still might have made it in your own little regard. Especially if you, especially the, especially if the aim is just to play football professionally and provide for your friends and family. You don't need to do that much, really. Especially if you play in England, you could play in League Two and probably be able to support your family and your friends for a long, long, long time if you invest wisely. So, twelve rules for life is definitely because you remember, like I, I know someone, I remember someone, someone might have said it. Who said it? Might have been Ty Lopez. You know, said something like, "Books, you can never waste money on books because." I spent what twenty quid on this, and now I've I've taken away that I need to set goals for my life. Right, I need to do away with this idea that oh, setting goals is corny. I have to set goals if I want to get somewhere. Like if if I don't know what I'm aiming at, how am I going to get there? 
that's 20 quid well spent for me. Like, I, that's not a waste at all. And I, I definitely understand that kind of adage uh, when it comes around to goal setting. So if you're out there and you're kind of like, oh man, books are a waste of money. What should I, I don't, what's the point of reading books? I, I, I implore you, trust me, read, read, read books. Books are super important. If, it's, if, if you get one thing out of spending 20 pounds, $20 out of a book, that's money well spent, man. Because that 20 pounds, especially nowadays or $20 or whatever, that can go really quickly and it can be wasted on frivolous shit. But if, if, if it's something that can set your life to be on course or whatever future that you want, $20 is something well spent. A second book that I finished in my uh, monthly book list was The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. Or Coyle. He wrote another book called The Talent Code that you might have heard of that was super popular in a, a few years ago. The Talent Code was basically a book that deconstructed uh, high-level performers and their obvious talents. And it basically... Um, made people aware that talented people don't come out out of the blue right they're usually cultivated from birth and they're usually cultivated in these small little pockets whether it's like tennis champions who all play this one camp from a certain age uh, are all taught under a one person da, la, 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 la. Um, and it was a, it was quite reassuring because a lot of people I remember there was a time when talent was getting over glory or over idolized people were like oh my god this person's fucking amazing it's like yeah they are amazing but what underlines it is like hard work like there is talent, right? You have to cultivate talent as well. It's not it doesn't just come out of the blue. Like you don't walk, you don't wake up being messy. Like it has you have to develop it over time. That hard work and dedication of training, looking after your nutrition, blah 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 blah, is what makes him talented. But then it's what makes him world class, of course. But the talent is obviously something you can't you can't deny. So, uh, but Culture Code is a book that kind of talks about the secrets of highly successful groups. It kind of analyzes uh, still Team Six. So like Marines, it analyzes uh, criminals like the Pink Panthers, who I fucking love. I watched that Sky uh, TV series. That was like four episodes. I think it might be called The Last Panthers. I definitely recommend you check it out. The Last the Pink Panthers are like a, a band of uh, bank robbers and jewelry thieves and who are mainly from like Soviet bloc countries like Georgia and shit. And a lot, uh, the origins of, of Pink Panther say that they all came out of the back of uh, the Civil War there. Some of them are former army specialists or whatever uh, from er very social de socio democratic backgrounds, whatever it may be. And they kind of go around um, pulling off these very outlandish and clever heists. I think they did one in London, they did one in Paris. Um, and, uh, and, and they do it with like military precision. Do you know what I mean? They're in and out like an absolute flash. They're fucking amazing. And they have an undying loyalty to one another. They rarely, rarely, if ever, snitch. Um, and he also looked at Pixar, who make um, all the amazing uh, animation movies that you see nowadays, like Toy Story and stuff. So it's an amazing book that kind of details of how successful groups are successful and what you can kind of apply what lessons you can you can learn from that you can you can apply to your own business or even just to your own group of friends whatever it, it may be and i've got loads of bits on here highlighted that i kind of thought were amazing is there anything i can pluck out from the blue randomly that might be of interest here let me scan through uh, uh, da, da, da. nyquist what have i got here there's loads of bits anyway i definitely recommend check it out it's called the culture code by daniel coyle uh Oh, let, let, me, let me read out this bit, see if this makes any sense. We have a place in our brain that's always worried about what people think of us, especially higher-ups. As far as our brain is concerned, if our social system rejects us, we could die. Given that our sense of danger is so natural and automatic, organisations have to do some pretty special things to overcome that natural trigger, which might, go to, which might go to explain why people are so afraid to like speak up about things, right? Or to lend their hand to solve an issue or solve a problem, or just in general to take risks because you don't want to be ostracised by the group. You don't want people to think that, you know, you're disrupt, you're disturbing influence or whatever because you're going to, you know, you're going to get kicked out. Because I remember uh, Whitney Cummings actually said on Joe Rogan website, Joe Rogan podcast, I haven't looked it up and see if it's true, but she said that our fear of speaking in public is intrinsic because it goes back to the idea of like when back in the day during the hunter-gatherer stage, you only had to speak in pub. You only had to speak in front of an audience when you had to plead for your life. Like you did, you did a crime. You did something that was wrong, and, and you were being judged by your your kind of like fellow villagers. They would kind of have you stand up in front of them and can explain uh, your innocence, right, or or fight your case. So the idea of standing up in front of people and talking out loud is intrinsically like a negative experience because you know you're hardwired to look to to feel as if like you might die uh, once you finish, which is interesting. 
but also it goes to show like how responsible as a, as a passion mentioned how <clears throat> how important it is for companies to get that right you know to feel make sure people feel inclusive make sure people feel comfortable in the environment that they're in obviously not to the detriment of the company because i think sometimes companies can bend over backwards too much for people you know and make you know and make way too many provisions uh especially when especially when the workforce isn't grateful for the provisions that you're making i think it can sometimes be super super annoying um but i guess that's probably the price of being a what you call it an entrepreneur for the main part or just running a business so that you always have to kind of battle that vibe of things uh what else i wanted to speak about i guess that might be it you know uh what else happened here? Yeah, that's it. I think actually doing show episode number fifty nine. I think that might be it. My list of stuff I'm speaking about. I've been speaking already for a little bit too long. I try and make these an hour long at the least, you know, because I think you know, I've I've got an hour worth of material in me, as you can as you can tell, in me, in me. Um. So yeah, this is actually doing show episode number fifty nine. Thank you as ever for tuning in and lending your ear to things I have to say. I hope you have gleaned something insightful from the hour and whatever so minutes you spent with me if you are on the fence about buying books or you know you don't like reading them now i implore you to visit my sponsor at audible.com for slash aggie that's audible.com for slash aggie to claim one free book credit and a 30-day free trial you can pick from over 400 titles with some of the titles being narrated by the authors themselves audible is something i've been using for a long 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 time even before i had them on sponsor i had i was always using audible i was always on the fence about all your books actually i was kind of person you know as as you might know I, I love reading physical books but sometimes when you just can't lug those shits around it's a good idea to read books or listen to them on audible so i definitely recommend you check them out when you have a minute um this is actually the show episode number 59 with your host Agostino, I'm gonna sign out now. For those of you listening on YouTube, it's gonna end right now. For those of you listening on iTunes, I'm gonna add a little song on the end of it. So please enjoy, and I'll see you guys on the other side.